Okay, guys, welcome back to the session. I hope you're uh, ready to rock again. And I am delighted to welcome Alan Clement, who is a trading strategies designer and, of course, independent trader with over 30 years experience in the financial industry. His career has both investment management and investment banking in it, and now he manages his own independent trading business. His main focus is the design and development of, of qualitative trading strategies that trade multiple markets. He is an international federation of technical analysis certified financial technician and former national director of the Australian Technical Analysis Association. He is talking today about how stop losses can be bad for your wealth. Oh, sorry, the presenter, so the screen should be yours any second. Okay, well, uh, thanks very much. It's great to be with you this afternoon, and thanks very much for the opportunity, Mike. Uh, it's, Mike runs some uh, great educational days, and this is uh, no exception, of course. So it's good to be a part of uh, what uh, Mike has put together for you today. Now, you're probably looking at the title of this presentation and thinking, uh, has this guy either missed the memo from Trading 101 that every time we enter a trade, we have to have a stop loss in place? Or is he telling us just to jump in the market and have no risk management in place whatsoever? Either way, this guy sounds like a nut. Well, <laughs> let's see if you're right. <laughs> So uh, I'll just uh, echo the disclaimer that was shown at the top. Nothing is a recommendation to buy or sell any financial instrument. Do your own homework. Uh, I'm not here to tell you what to do. Just, just give you some ideas to research. Uh, Mike's covered my uh, background already, but I'll, I'll just sort of underline that I've basically tried a bit of everything. I've traded every type of financial instrument that's out there. I've traded every time frame. I've traded every different style, and I've found the small number of things that work for me, and I've stuck to that. So that's what I would recommend you do too. Let's kick off with a quote, though. Uh, this quote says, I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for taking risks. So who said that? Was it Warren Buffett? Was it Elon Musk? Was it Jeff Bezos? Well, in fact, no. It was someone who had been bankrupt three times in a row. So the point here is that uh, taking risks can make you either wealthy or very poor. And the only difference between those two is in how you manage those risks. And so that's what we're here to talk about today is how do we best manage our risks in order to maximize our return and minimize our uh, downside risk. So by the end of this presentation, what I hope you'll get is some understanding of uh, risk uh, as a function of the overall strategy that you trade rather than as an individual trade. Uh, and you know, we'll look at some ways that you can uh, measure uh, risk itself to give you a, a good understanding of, of where the risk lies in your particular strategy. We'll have a look at the stop losses in particular, the key point of this presentation and why uh, I believe and hopefully I can show you the evidence of that, that uh, stop losses are one of the worst ways, that certainly one of the most costly ways that you can control risk in a, any particular strategy. But <clears throat> that then begs the question, well, what other ways can we, uh, what other methods can we use to be a bit more clever about um, applying risk management to our strategies. Excuse me. <coughs> All right. So there's a, we're going to look at uh, the application of stop losses and risk management through the prism of two different very popular trading approaches. In fact, these are probably the two main trading approaches that are available to most retail traders out there. The first is the, the so-called mean revert strategy where you're basically betting that the market is about to reverse. This probably falls into the category of what the last guys were uh, showing there. Uh, you're basically betting that the market is going to go, you know, it's, it's gone down, you're going to bet it's going up or it's been up and you're going to bet that it's falling. If we're looking at, we're going to look at stock trading applications, mostly long side only. Uh, so for this type of strategy, we're looking at the, a market that's, say, in a long term uptrend, but it's been beaten down in a short uh, term uh, uh, time horizon and we're going to bet that it's going to revert towards the mean and then we're going to exit at the mean at, at, on a profit target. The other one, of course, is the trend following strategy where you're betting the market's going to continue in the same direction, usually buying into a well-developed trend already and then you're going to bet that the, the trend is going to continue, you're going to hold for the, the continuation of that trend and then exit when that trend ends. 
Um, I'm just going to pull up the uh, Q&A here. So uh, please feel free to uh, drop uh, questions in if you if you have questions at all. Uh, I'll try and they've got a lot of content to get through. This is all killer and no filler, hopefully. Uh, but if there's some time at the end, we'll, we'll get to the questions as well. So let's have a look at uh, measuring trade risk. Now, uh, the the most obvious uh, way to measure trade risk is well how much if I enter this trade this particular trade right now what's what's my downside risk for that trade but that really is almost impossible of a question to answer because the variance the the uh, the variance that's in the market. Uh, and the variability of market risk and volatility and so on means that no two trades are going to be equal. No true trades are going to carry the same amount of market risk. So there's no point in saying this, this is a 2% trade or a 1% trade or you know, a one ATR trade or whatever it happens to be. It's, there's just no consequence. Plus, if you look at your strategy as a whole, you're going to have many, many different outcomes in terms of your trade. You're going to have small winners, big winners, big losers, small losers. So there's really, you know, trying Trying to nail down what a number that you can use for each individual trade is, is almost impossible. So the way that I like to think about risk is to apply it to the strategy uh, as a whole. And there's a number of ways we can measure risk within the strategy. Uh, one particular way is using you know good old drawdown. So what's my drawdown risk? How how long is the strategy in drawdown for? What, how, what's the depth of the strategies? What's my maximum drawdown and so on? So here we're looking at a, a large cohort of either past trades or simulated trades or you know trades that you've got from your own trade record. And you can then gather up all the stats for that and find these numbers. Another thing to look at is the what's called the volatility of returns. So each of you, you know, your returns are going to be different for every trade. You might have a two percent trade. You might have a minus 0.5 trade. You might have a three percent trade. Bundle those all together, and you'll end up getting the ups and downs in your equity line. And one way you can measure that is the so-called ulcer index. So I won't go into depth about what that is. You can easily Google it. But it's basically a way of measuring uh, the, the drawdown risk, both in terms of depth length, longevity. Um, the guys that invented it are basically trying to come up with a, a number of the size of the also that you're going to get from trading a particular strategy. And finally, we can look at the so-called risk adjust, adjusted returns, which is basically how much bang are you getting for your buck? How much return are you managing to generate for a given unit of risk? And we can we can measure that in a number of different ways. The so-called MAR ratio, which is your compound annual return divided by your maximum drawdown, is one popular way. There's also things like Sharpe ratio, which are used uh, certainly on the professional side of the industry, which is your you know, average daily returns divided by your volatility of returns. So, so how straight and upward leaning is your equity curve, basically? So, what's the problem with stops? Well, uh, the first problem is that there, you know, where do you put it? <laughs> it tends to be quite an arbitrary placement. Either it's going to be something you eyeball on a chart and say, okay, it's below the last low, or it's two ATR away or it's 5% below my entry price. All of those things are just very arbitrary and they have no uh, real, um, they have they have no real evidence about whether that's a good place or a bad place or whether for this particular trade that's gonna come, whether that's a good point to actually have a stop in the market. You're also exiting at the worst point of the trade, okay? So if you're thinking of a long side trade, you're entering at a particular point, the market goes down, hits your stop, you're getting out at the worst possible drawdown within that trade. So you're, you're always locking in the worst a loss could be. Um, you know, granted, it, the market may then go further below where your stop loss was, so you may try to be attempting to save some of that drawdown loss, but as you will see when we get into this, uh, that 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 is actually a, a, a folly. There's also potential for slippage. So if you're if you're using a, a stop loss, basically becomes a market order to sell when you when it when it goes through your order price. And if you're in a fast moving market, everybody else is trying to sell at the same time. So your market order is just going to become subject to the whim of the market maker, and he's going to fill fill you at whatever price he likes. Uh, and that 
is ordinarily going to lead to slippage and sometimes can lead to quite a lot of slippage. So what we want to try and do is rather than sell when everybody else is selling, let's try selling when everybody else is buying, for example. That's one way to get around this. Stops also give you the illusion of the protection. So what you're tr what you're thinking is, okay, I've got stop in the market. That's going to protect my capital. It's going to protect my returns, and it's going to reduce the amount of overall strategy risk I have. It's going to reduce my drawdowns. And as we'll see when we get into the uh, the nuts and bolts here, that that is really simply an illusion. That there the that it's actually not true when you look at the hard numbers, which we will. Uh, it's also a form of insurance. If you think of uh, insurance in your daily life, whether that's life insurance or medical insurance or pet insurance, you know yourself, you can go from one year to the next to the next many times without actually cashing in your insurance at all. And every month you're still paying premiums and that premium then becomes a drag. If you can imagine rather than putting a market order to stop your trade in the market, if you used instead a put option, uh, to protect your stock holding, then that put option obviously comes with a premium attached to it. It costs money to buy that put protection, and that and that premium basically erodes to zero if the if the stop is if the put's never um, uh, exercised. And so so that that premium because basically becomes a drag. You might think a stop a market order stop has no cost, but we'll, as you'll see in a minute, that's not so necessarily true. All insurance costs money. And as we'll see when we get into these stops, as you will see, and uh, I hope you will become to appreciate, is they can be very costly for your bottom line. All right, let's get into the detail now. So let's firstly have a look at a classic mean reversion strategy and how we, uh, if we apply stops to that, what the outcomes are and what, uh, what else we can do uh, to try and uh, manage risk. So I'm going to assume that most people on this uh, webinar today are uh, have some exposure to the tr to trading who you know they they basically I'm sure most of you would be able to put together this type of strategy quite easily you're basically looking for an extreme low in price usually in a, a, a stock or a market that's already in an uptrend you're buying at the uh, at the close to the extreme low hopefully and then you're going to sell as the market reverts back towards its mean it's a it's a very well-known market inefficiency it repeats over and over again every single market you look at has got that zigzag pattern in the um in the equity in the uh, price line and that's basically what we're trading here so uh holds up to 10 positions and no stop loss so the only exit is this profit target which is set at the mean of the um uh of the price uh, range in this case we're using bollinger bands and a, and a me the mean down the middle is basically the moving average so uh, very, very simple, very straightforward type of strategy. So if we were to put this, these rules through a back test, so this is um, close to what we would uh, get as an outcome over a 10 or so year period. Uh, this is a very busy strategy. This is, this is basically the vanilla option, if you like. There's no, we haven't added anything fancy uh, yet. Uh, but you can see it produces a chunky old return, 34% per annum, but there's a big cost in, in doing business here. There's a 34% maximum historical drawdown. That's, for most people, I would fancy, even most people on this call would think that's probably too much to bear. It takes a lot of trades, probably about 1.5 trades a day. Um, 1.2% expectancy. The MAR is the annual return divided by the max drawdown, so it's sitting at one. Sharp's 0.88, so that's good. Anything approaching one or above in Sharp is really good. And the ulcer index there is 6.7. For the ulcer index, lower is better, less ulcer. <laughs> that's the way to think about it. Uh, nice enough to look at equity curve, but that, that drawdown number is obviously the key thing that we want to try and manage. So, the obvious question is, well, seems like a risky strategy. Let's add a stop. Here's an example of a trade comes in, drops down through our Bollinger Bands. We we take an entry here, but oops, the market keeps falling after our entry. Don't forget, mean revert strategy. You're basically buying when everybody else is selling. So you are running the risk that the market is going to continue in that same direction and you're going to get left high and dry as we were in this case. The, the natural exit, the... Um, profit target back at the mean is way down here where this blue arrow is. So if we had added a stop loss in here at some given distance away from our entry point, 
you can see that that would have been a good exit. We got out there. Uh, we could have, we would have got out down here. So we've actually saved ourselves a little bit of drawdown there. And we've hopefully protected a little bit of our uh, return and we've not given too much back in this one particular trait. So seems like a good idea. So let's have a look. So if we apply the stop loss to the, the baseline strategy, place your bets. Do you think it's going give, to give better outcome or worse outcome? Well, I won't keep you waiting. The answer is worse, a lot worse. Uh, the, every single metric is worse. So the compound now you return erodes from 34% down to 23%, so less, uh, te more than 10% less per annum. Uh, the, the drawdown, max drawdown goes up. So not down, but up uh, from 34 to 35%. Uh, the, we're taking more trades, which is never a good thing. Every time you enter a trade in the market, you're taking on market risk. You're you're incurring friction costs. It's just a bad thing. The, you want to take less trades, not more, for any particular strategy. Our expectancy has got worse, so we're we're actually not making as much money on each particular trade. Our MAR is down. Our SHARP's down. Our ulcer index X is up. Remember, our ulcer is getting bigger. <laughs> And the stop's been hit almost 600 times out of 3,500 trades. So that's a that's a decent number of times our stop's getting hit. But hold on a minute. You know, we we're putting in protection. We're 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 adding protection to our strategy. So we should be trying to cap our downside and protect our upside. We're actually getting the opposite. We're reducing returns and increasing drawdown rather than the reverse. So what's going on here? Well. Maybe two ATR is too far. I mean, two ATR is a fair distance away from uh, from your entry price. Maybe what we do need to do is bring the stop a little bit closer. So let's bring it up to one ATR and see what happens then. What do we think? Better or worse? Place your bets. <laughs> worse, even worse. We've basically half the uh, return from original baseline. Our drawdowns also uh, bigger than it was in the baseline. It's about, it hasn't budged much. So bringing the, the stop in from two ATR to one ATR hasn't really helped any in terms of the drawdown risk. We're now taking even more trades. We're getting clipped and clipped and clipped and clipped. So we're turning over way, way more trades. Our expectancy is through the floor. MAR ratio is down. Sharp is halved from its original, less than half. And our ulcer, ulcer is now ulcer index is now up into double figures, which is not good. And you can see that our stops now getting hit 1,400 times out of 4,200 trades. So a third of all trades are getting stopped out. But you know that this that doesn't seem right. Again, it's just counterintuitive. Our stop should be protecting us, not doing the opposite. And the closer we bring it in, we're actually getting worse results, where we should be getting better results because we're we're taking less risk per trade. Okay, so that does beg the question, what happens if we do the opposite? Let's push the stop way out so it's not getting hit very much. So let's push it way out to 5 ATR. So this is miles away. So the first thing you can see here is it's only getting hit 80 times, so hardly at all. And yet, and yet, it's still worse. <laughs> the, the return is still down. It's recovered almost to the baseline, but still not as good. The drawdown is now way worse. It's gone from 34 to 38%. Trades are about the same. Expectancy is just about recovered. Mars about you know back to more or less where it was. But our sharps down, our ulcer index is up. Um, so even as far away as five ATR, you know you're getting towards what some people might call a disaster stop. Like what if this stop goes to zero on me? Well, this would catch that, uh, and it caught it 80 times, but it still makes the outcomes worse. So let's take this to this logical confusion. Let's uh, conclusion. Let's take 10 ATR. 10 ATR. That's like a mile and a half away from where we entered. It only got hit eight times out of over 3,000 trades, and yet it's still just as bad. <laughs> so the return is just about recovered to where it was, uh, but the drawdown's worse, and you know most of the other metrics are off just by a little bit. So even putting a you know, a disaster stop in a way, 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 way down, miles away from where we're trading, still makes the outcomes worse than having no stop at all, which is what the baseline is. So what's going on? What's going on here? Well, um, don't forget that 
our exit, our natural exit in the baseline strategy is always a profit target. So the market has to always rise to get back to the profit target. Okay, the stock might go to zero. Okay, you're going to get one or you know one of them in your probably lifetime or you know not very many to make a difference. But for every other trade, you're going to get the market rising to back to to um, uh, to get out. If we put a stop in, we're basically locking in a loss at that point. If our stop was here. Yes, it's it stopped a little bit of adverse excursion down here, but it also prevented the trade recovering to get back to it. Yes, now this this trade was still a loss, but it was a smaller loss using the natural exit than using the stop loss. So every time you use a stop loss, you're basically locking in a loss at the worst point of the trade. Here it was the second to worst candle of the trade, um, and you're basically uh, avoiding or or you're preventing the strategy from doing its work and, and getting back to a decent level. Yes, it will have a little bit more adverse excursion, but on the and the end result in terms of PL, it will be better than using the stop. And that's why the stop is uh, not um, a very efficient mode of exit for this particular strategy. Okay, so but let's go back to the, the original. I mean this this drawdown number is still way too big for most of us to trade. So what other levers are there that we can pull? If, we've, if we're now all agreed that a stop loss is not the way to do it, then what else can we do? Well, a couple of things we can look at. One is our position size per trade. So at the moment, remember, if you recall, we've got 10 positions. If we deploy a, a, a capital allocation to that, then each trade is gonna trade at a fixed fraction. Uh, of 10% per uh, trade, so that 10 times 10 gives us a uh, gives us 100% uh, of our capital. That's called trading at full fraction or a fraction of one. If we decide to trade at a smaller fraction, then that will make all of our trades smaller. So if I traded at uh, say a half fraction, 0.5, that means I would have 10 5% trades. And out of my 100% capital, I would always have 50% of my capital kept in cash as a cash buffer. So that's one way to kind of make the metrics all kind of a little bit slimmer and easier to trade. All the entries, all the entries and exits stay the same. There's no trade. There's no difference to the actual underlying strategy. It's just the position size per trade. The other one we'll have a look at is the number of max open positions. So again, we're trading at 10 max open positions. What happens if we trade with only five max open? What happens if we trade with 15 max open? How do things change then? Because obviously you've got a certain amount of opportunity in the uh, market and you want to find the sweet spot between concentrating your uh, capital in the right number of trades that's going to maximize your opportunity and spreading your uh, capital between enough trades so that you're not getting uh, too drawn into the volatility of one or two stocks in particular. Okay, so let's have a look at first varying the position size fraction. So the baseline, as I said, trades at a fraction of one. We're going to uh, try and uh, look at some numbers smaller than that because remember, we want to try and reduce this max historical drawdown. So let's take it right down. So 0.4 of a fraction. So now I'm trading. 10 4% positions, I'm always going to keep 60% of my capital in cash. And that reduces these numbers way down. Remember, the, the entries and exits are all the same. So most of these metrics are not going to change because they're 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 you know they're just um they are the number of trades is the same, the expectancy per trade is going to be the same, and the sharp's going to be the same because we're not really changing the numerator or the denominator of these particular metrics. All we're changing is the size. So you can see going to 40% brings basically everything down from 100% down to 40%. But this drawdown number is obviously much better. 2.7 on the ulcer index. So this is something that you're going to be easily able to sleep with holding overnight and so on. Uh, Roger, wondering what time frame I prefer. I, daily time frame is for me. Yeah, just trade to, to, to at least test everything at the, the daily time frame. I have weekly strategies as well, but I usually test them all on the daily time frame to to get get the correct uh, risk allocation. Uh, okay, so that's point four. Now that that might be too 
little for some people. Maybe some of you might think, well, you know, 14s, I'd rather trade with a bigger maximum historical drawdown if I want to target a higher return. Okay, well, let's try 0 0.6. So here we're trading at 0.6 of a fraction. So 10, 6% trades, 40% of our capital left in cash. And here you can see that we're getting to a 21% drawdown risk, which, you know, certainly for me and for most people who trade their own capital is bearable. Uh, and that's returning a decent, you know, 20% per annum, which is a, a decent number for most people. Again, most metrics are the same. The ulcer has gone up a little bit. It's kind of in the middle between the, the, the lowest and, and the baseline. And if we just sort of go to the other side of the curve, if you like, and go out to point eight, you can see, well, now the, the drawdown starts getting bigger again. It's still lower than the baseline strategy, but 27 is probably getting a little bit big for uh, certainly for me and, and probably for most people. So by performing this analysis on by varying your position size, you can see that you can find the sweet spot that's going to marry up the result of the outcomes with your own personal risk tolerance. And that's basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to we have a strategy which has a good return to drawdown ratio or a good uh, risk to reward ratio. Uh, what we're trying to then do is massage it so that it fits with our own personal risk tolerance. So this is one way to achieve that. The other thing we can look at is varying the max open position. So again, our baseline was always using 10 positions. So what that means is uh, if I wake up one day and there is uh, 15 orders to place, then I can only choose the first 10 of those. And then once my all my positions are filled, I can't take any more signals after that until I sell some of my positions down or get exit signals from my positions. But that doesn't have to be the case. What if we limited it to a smaller number and or what if we uh, made that max bigger? You know, then if I made the max 15 and there was 20 signals, I would be able to then take 15 and they would be one fifteenth of my portfolio rather than one tenth. So they when the max open positions gets bigger, your position size per position gets smaller and vice versa. Open positions get smaller, the position per, uh, the size per position gets bigger. So let's go way, way down and start with two. So I'm only gonna take the first two opportunities that come along and I'm, uh, and I'm gonna pile all my capital, 50% of my capital into each of those positions. And you can see what happens, it's probably logical. Uh, I'm now basically hooking my, uh, capital up to the outcomes of two stocks and if you you know if you look at the volatility of stocks compared to the volatility of an index for example which is an average you'll you'll know that stocks are way more volatile so the fewer number that you're holding means your the concentration of your capital is much greater and your volatility of returns is going to be much more exposed to a smaller number of stocks so this this is not what we want lower return higher drawdown and worse metrics overall okay what happens if we go to six ah well now it's starting to look a little bit nicer we've got uh, higher return lower drawdown so now we're getting to where we want to be fewer number of trades okay because we're only holding six we're not we're not um, we're not as busy with the number of orders we're having to place so again less trades is always better because you know less fr less friction costs less opportunity for human error and all the rest of it um our expectancy per trade has stayed the same so we're 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 being just as productive but remember our position size is bigger because we're only holding six uh, so we're, we're able to make a higher return because of that. Uh, our Mars improved and our Sharp is, uh, is uh, well, it's about in line with where we started before and our ulcer hasn't really gone up a lot. So this, this is starting to look certainly like something you could trade. 29% is maybe still a little bit pokey on the downside. Uh, but if we go to the other extreme and take 20 trades, well, you can see here everything gets worse again. So, uh, so now we're holding 25% trades rather than 10, 10% trades as we were at the start. And here the, the problem is that on a lot of days, there just won't be 20 opportunities. There may only be 10 or 12, which means you've got eight slots that go unfilled. So here we're, we're, we're suffering from lack of opportunity and our capital's not being used as efficiently as it could be. 
but you can see in the middle here this um, this number of six here is actually uh, doing quite nicely and so again you can you can marry these last two approaches together we could vary the max open positions and then we could vary the position size within that six and we can get something that actually looks nice because now we've got a 1.3 mar and by adjusting the position size of that we would retain that 1.3 but we would be able to control the the uh, the drawdown slider if you like uh, to get it towards our own personal risk tolerance so hopefully that gives you an idea that there are better ways to manage risk rather than just relying on uh, a stop loss. And so that's that particular strategy. Okay. Um, blah, 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 blah. Okay. The question is, uh, this is for stocks. How would it? How would you? How is it you would like to? How is it you would avoid a crash happening? Like when do you get out if it turns against you? Okay. Well, this this. This this particular strategy has those rules built into them. You know, it still takes drawdowns. It's not it's not a, a drawdown free strategy. But you would when you were designing your strategy to begin with, you would build the rules in that uh, that avoided those those crash type situations. Okay, so you could have for for example a market regime filter that looks for times when the market is about to fall off a cliff. Those those can be developed using market breadth or rate of change type indicators. So so have that built into the rules of the strategy rather than relying on something as blunt as a as a stop loss. Okay, let's flip over to the uh, trend following strategy now. So mostly you'll be familiar with uh, this trend following type of approach is very straightforward here. It's basically using a channel uh, type of approach. It's a, it's a marker that tracks the highest highs in a range and the lowest lows in a, in a given look back period. I don't recall what the look back is, but you can see how this one's tracking the highs. This red line here is tracking the lows. We buy when the, the price breaks out above that um, uh, top channel marker and then we sell when it uh, breaks down through the, the bottom channel marker holds up to 10 positions again no stop loss in the system um, now you could argue that this bottom tra channel marker acts a bit like a trailing stop um, but either way with every type of trend following approach you you're getting in you're holding when the trend's in place and you have to find some way for when the trend ends this is one crude way of doing it and we'll have a look at some others but the point is that there's no there's nothing in the middle of these two channels to get us out there's no there's no fixed stop there's no trailing stop of, uh, that, that follows the price up or anything like that it's just a simple entry and exit okay so let's have a look at the outcomes of this one uh, over a 10 or so year period and you can see here uh, it's not, I mean, it's not punching the lights out of the strategy at the moment, um, but, you know, you probably wouldn't be unhappy to have it as part of your portfolio. Uh, it's only only producing 12% per annum only. I mean, double digit returns are never to be sneezed at, but, uh, but it does carry a bit of a chunky drawdown risk on the downside. On the upside, it only takes, 20, it's only had 222 trades over that period, and each trade is 4.5%. So, so these are chunky, chunky old returns. Uh, but the, the the issue here is this number here, which is the the return, um, at least in, in in my book, is, is is a bit too low for the amount of drawdown risk in the strategy. So so that is certainly a number that I would be looking to try and improve. How do we either improve the return side or reduce the drawdown side so that the so that we're actually getting better bang for our buck? Uh, sharp ratio is low there at 0.3 and ulcer is 6.3 and that's that's what the equity curve looks like so let's have a look at um what we can do with this but first thing as we as we might just say is oh my god this looks risky maybe we should add a stop loss i think you can <laughs> tell where i'm going with this uh but you know there's a fair old distance between these highs this high channel marker and these low channel markers and you can see in this particular instance we got into a trade it didn't go anywhere it just rolled over and we would have got a massive loss down here where this blue arrow is had we had a stop loss in place uh here uh then you can see that on this sort of red candle here we would have got stopped out and that would have saved us from drawdown. So, you know, just looking at a sample of one trade, uh, we can say that actually having a stop loss is actually a fairly wise choice because it's prevent it's it's saving us from uh, drawdown and it's hopefully um, 
it's simply protecting our returns that we've already got in the bank. So that seems like a logical thing to do, doesn't it? Well, look, let's see. And uh, the the betting's probably all one way now, but uh, I'll take that uh, because yes, you're right. It's not a good idea after all. The drawdown gets uh, sorry. The return gets worse. The drawdown gets worse. Uh, the number of trades gets more, and you know we don't need to labour the point about more trades is worse. Uh, the expectancy is almost halved, so that's that's significant. Uh, our Mars down, our Sharps way down, uh, our ulcer is getting worse, and uh, out of 365 trades, we got stopped out 200 times. So that's that's more than two thirds. No, hold on, certainly more than 180. I should have done this in my head earlier, shouldn't I? It's more than half. More than half the trades got stopped out. So, um, so you can see that adding a stop is is actually even in a trend following situation, it doesn't actually add anything. In fact, it makes uh, everything worse. Now, you know, I could go on and bring the stop closer and push the stop further away, and I think you'll get the picture about how that would uh, come out. So we'll just skip over that part, and we'll have a look at well, why. In a trend following situation where we're you know buying a market that's rising is the stop particularly bad well hopefully this uh, will give some uh, explanation to that imagine a trade where we we buy the breakout here we've we've bought this uh, candle here at the close the, the trade goes against us we've got a trailing stop in here it goes in our favor up here and then it comes down and clips our stop and we're out okay so it was a 2.3 loss big deal no strategy wins all the time. You're going to get losses uh, along the way. But here's the thing. We had a 6.5 MFE stands for maximal favorable excursion. In other words, the trade went in our favor 6.5%. We gave all of that back and more, and we ended up with an 8.2% drawdown. So so we've we've given up 6.5% of potential profit and we've introduced 8.2% drawdown into our results neither of which seem like a very good idea so now you're probably thinking well that sounds fair enough alan but nobody rings the bell here at the top and tells us it's time to get out do they or do they or do they perhaps there's a way that we can try and figure out when the market is in this kind of rollover phase. I mean, don't forget with with uh, with with stocks in particular, but just look at any market, it, especially if the trend is strong. The market doesn't go straight up and straight down. What it tends to do is it goes up and then it goes through some consolidation phase or sideways uh, action or uh, head and shoulders, whatever you want to call it, and then it rolls over. And what happens through this through this phase in the in the middle there, when the market's consolidating, is the momentum's falling. The momentum is tending towards zero, and and that's something that we can measure. So let's go back to our baseline and just recall that this is the number that we want to try and improve. We want to either reduce our drawdown or increase our return. So it begs the question once again: What levers can we pull? Well. We've still got open the last two from our uh, from the last one. We can adjust the position size per trade. We could look at the maximum uh, number of open positions here. We you know we're we're starting with ten once again, just a nice round number I picked, but that may not be the optimal. So I'll leave those two for you to do as homework. I won't uh, do them again here. But the the third one here I want to look at now, which is to to try and find a more efficient uh, trading strategy. Don't forget, in the vanilla strategy, we have to wait for the market to fall all the way back to that lower channel marker. But if what if there's a way that we can try and find that rollover stage? Well, here's one way. Imagine, I mean, what what is a trend following strategy? It's basically a momentum strategy. We're 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 trading the momentum of the market. And we want to stay with the momentum until the momentum's not there anymore. So you can imagine if we go into a trade somewhere down this blue, uh, the bottom of this blue arrow here, we ride it up. And here you can see that um, consolidation phase I was talking about. The market's no longer going up. The buyers are losing strength. The sellers are starting to take control. That all takes time to work its way out. And then the market starts to fall over here on the right hand side of the chart. If we look at something as, and there's many ways to measure momentum, of course, you can use uh, rate of change. Um, 
the there's yeah there's there's dozens of just google momentum indicators and you'll yeah you'll you'll get, go down a very deep rabbit hole uh, but let's just look at something that's very basic and also very popular which is the macd i'm sure most of you are familiar with what the, the macd is if not google it uh, what the MACD is, is, is it's basically a momentum indicator. Now, most people use it on a very short time frame and it becomes basically an oscillator. But here, if you lengthen out the parameters, as I've done here, the blue line becomes much more of a momentum indicator. And you can see how as the market rises, the blue line follows the market up. And then as the market starts to fall, you can see how early the blue line turned way before the market actually turned down. So that that loss of momentum as the market tends towards, the momentum tends towards zero is, uh, you can pick that up on a momentum indicator early. It basically will get, it's basically a leading indicator of where the market's about to head. And you can see here that had we used the crossover of the signal line here as our exit, it would have got us out here, away in the, in the middle of this range, hardly gave anything back from the highs. Whereas if we had used the stop loss or the original exit, you can see we would probably would have exited away down here. So by doing this, we're actually protecting much more of our return that we've gained already, and we're giving back a lot less on the way to the uh, to the exit. So if just have a look at that as an example. Here's here's the original strategy. Here you can see it took a trade here. Uh, it's gone down, clipped at its exit. It's gone back in here, and it's uh, clipped out. Uh, down the bottom here as well. So two trades, one was a complete loser. In fact, it was a 22% loser and one was a 24% winner giving basically, you know, a wash as the result. If we had used with, you know, got rid of that bottom exit completely and just entered here and then used the MACD as our exit, you can see it got us out up here. So this is doing two things. One, it's, it's given us a much better return, one trade with 20% return. And the second thing is that we're also selling when everybody else is buying as the market's rising here, not trying to sell on this red candle as the previous strategy was doing, in which case we probably would have got slipped horribly. Um, and so you can see, hopefully, that that's a better way to do it. Now, I'm going to have to uh, get, on, <laughs> get on my bike because uh, we're fast running out of time. Uh, but the takeaway here is, it gives much better outcomes. We get higher profit, lower return, less trades, higher expectancy, and so on, and we end up with a better MAR of 1.1%. So that using that momentum exit rather than the stop loss or the channel line gives us a good outcome. There's the original strategy, and there's what the, the revised one looks like, so much better. Okay, so just to summarize that, as I've hopefully tried to illustrate that when we think about risk in a strategy, rather than thinking it on a trade by trade basis, it's better to think about risk in the aggregate strategy wide. Stop losses are one of the worst ways in terms of costs that you can uh, manage your risk in a particular strategy. And as hopefully you've seen here, they tend to do more harm than good. Try to get clever about thinking of other ways to manage risk. Uh, and also, you know, ways to adjust things like position size, max number open positions, and so on. And you know, yes, I'm the systematic trading guy, so test, test, test everything. Um, and I'll just put the rider in because I'll know I'll get questions about this. Uh, but you know, if you're trading a single instrument and you're betting 100% of your capital on it, it might actually be wise to have some protection in there uh, that sits in the market. So in, in outlying cases, stop losses may still have some value to you, but I would just say, make it your last port of call and not your first, try everything else first. Uh, before I finish up and take questions, I'm just gonna give a shout out to the ATAA, which um, both myself and Mike are involved in. If you're an independent trader and you wanna get in, get together with other like-minded um, uh, independent traders, or certainly around Australia, uh, then get involved with the ATAA. It's very low cost. You'll get access to all their chapter meetings, both in person and hybrid. Uh, you'll be able to network with other independent traders like myself and Mike. Uh, they do training. They have a, a conference every year. It really is a great organization. Can't talk highly enough about them. And this is me. 
you can get in touch with me, send me an email just in case I don't get through all the questions. And um, you can find me on Twitter at Helix Trader. Helix Trader is my own personal uh, sort of development website. Smart Systematic Trading is where you'll find some of my my own uh, strategies that I trade. And you might not be surprised to learn that none of them use stop losses. Um, but uh, yeah, if you've, I'm easy to track down. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm everywhere. So, um, so feel free to reach out. Uh, I hope that's been useful to, to you, uh, and I thank you very much for your time. I'll just jump on the question line and see if there um, is anything. Michael says, is there a way to, ma uh, to measure MFE, which is maximum favorable excursion? Uh, yes, uh, I use a piece of software called Ami Broker, which does it quite nicely. It gives you in the trade results, it gives you the uh, MFE for every single uh, trade. So you get a trade by trade MFE number. You also get an MAE, Maximum Adverse Excursion number. So um, Ami Broker, shout out to them as well. Um, let's see, you might just uh, kick me off if I'm uh, taking too long here, but I'll just try and battle through another couple of questions. Uh, yeah, so uh, are you doing this on one hour, where are our charts? Chris, it really, the time frame doesn't make a difference. This is um, this is time frame agnostic. It will work on any time frame. So, uh, so try them on all. Uh, Anthony says, if close half or adjust our position rather than close all the position, let the roulette run and exit. Would it be worse than without a stop loss? Well, I I can't answer that question because I don't know what your particular strategy is, but. Uh, the question basically is, should I close half the position and let the rest run? Uh, I would say the only way to find that out is to test both and see which one looks best on paper. Um, do, 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 do I do automotive, aut automotive trades? Yes, I, yes I, uh, I do do automatic trading. All my trading is automatic, in fact. And I will say that I'm actually in the process of developing a, a, a product that will allow you to uh, to develop uh, to trade your own um, systematic strategies uh, mechanically so uh, drop me a line I'll, uh, I'll keep you on the list for that when it comes out it shouldn't be too far away uh, la, 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 la. So, if you're if, yeah if you're willing and able uh, when that's launched I'm sure there'll be plenty of people interested so if you wouldn't mind coming and doing another session when that's live and ready to rock and roll I'd be happy to have you along to chat about it if if that would work for you that that would be great yeah i'd love the opportunity uh, mike that would be fantastic yeah probably probably a month or two away from that so i'll uh, i'll certainly keep you posted on that fantastic. Uh, i'll just answer one more here because jonathan says 2008 crash uh happening again could wipe you out without a stop loss well is is that really true i mean are your are your systematic rules that loose that it would it would allow your trades to ride all the way down uh, to the bottom and uh, and get wiped out down there. If that's the case, you need to have a, a good look at uh, the systematic rules because you should be have you should have crash protection as I mentioned earlier somewhere in your rules that avoids that situation. Um, you know, something as simple as a 200 day moving average, for example, is going to get you out way before the, uh, the, the the sort of worst of the crash starts happening. So investigate um, uh, market regime filters. Again, Google's your friend. Uh, you'll find out stuff there. I'll leave it there, Mike, because I know you're under time pressure. But thanks again, everybody, for your time today. And I wish you good luck, good trading, and bye for now. Alan, thank you so much. I've left both the um, system, uh, smartsystematictrading.com link and your email address in the chat, guys. If you want to connect with Alan again, and I'm sure many of you do, um, then that's how to do it. And of course, we'll have you back soon, Alan. Alan, thank you so much for your time, effort, and energy today. Awesome as usual, buddy. And, Great. Uh, My pleasure. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.